welcome back to CPC. Welcome back. So right now, guys, I'm just going to give you two seconds to send this link to someone, to your auntie, your uncle, everyone on your contact list. Please, please, please send this link to someone because you never know. This less service could be a blessing for someone. So anyway, guys, here at CPC, we have four core values, which spells out facts. The first one is 100% friendliness. As you can see, I'm smiley, I'm happy. Here at CPC, everyone is like this. Everyone's smiley, everyone's friendly. The second one is attendance. The fact that you're here today shows that you're very committed to CPC and thank you for attending. But guys, we can increase this number up more. Last week we have 100, but I think we can get 110. So keep sending this link to someone. The third one is commitment, which is you're here today. You guys are always here every Sunday. So thank you for being committed to the work of God. And the last one is 100% time and offering. So here at CPC, we believe in time and offering. You're not obliged to, but you're just encouraged to give time. So thank you guys. So before we start the service, we can't start the service without prayer. So right now, wherever you are, join me in prayer as before we start the service. Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for your grace and your mercies that allowed us to come and be together for this service. We thank you for everything you've done. We pray, oh God, that the Holy Spirit will take charge. We pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us through this service. We pray for the man of God that's about to preach. Pray for the praise and worship. And we pray for every individual that's watching us on the TV screens, on their phone. Father, whatever their heart desire is, we pray that they shall receive it this week, this month, this year, oh Lord. We thank you for their lives and we thank you for what you're about to do in the lives of every CPC member. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Right, guys, I can see the numbers increasing, but I think we can do better than that. So keep sending the link, keep sending the link. And I want to see you guys in the comments, flooding it up, welcoming each other, being happy. Okay, without further ado, we're going to head over to the littest, sickest band in the world. We're not talking about the composers. We're talking about our very own PPT. So wherever you are, be upstanding, be ready to worship praise and dance as we bring onto your screen PPT. Oh, uh -huh. 
We thank you, Lord, for your power, Lord, for your power to change, for your power to set free, for your power to deliver, Lord. Yeah, I was in the boat, I was. 
Okay, guys. Oh, PPT. Listen, I'm actually out of breath because you guys, <laughs> you rocked the stage. Thank you so much for your commitment to a CPC. Thank you for always providing us with a heart of worship and always sending us into the presence of God. We appreciate you guys so much. And I can't wait to see you in person. Right, guys. We're going into a very, very important part of this service, which is... Dun, dun, dun. The preaching. So, make sure you get your notebooks yeah, ready. Ready to receive something from this man of God because he is powerful. And every time that he comes on the stage, comes on the screen, I guarantee you that you will be blessed. So, wherever you are, with a smile on your face and upstanding, please let's welcome our very own dad, Bishop Francis Sarpong. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. God richly bless you for logging on. I'm delighted to have you here with me. It's an exciting time. I want to say thank you um, for the worship team. I want to say thank you for the great solo that was sung. May the Lord bless you. Before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you. I want to bless you for who you are. I Thank you, the Lord, you've granted us yet another Sunday in, in this year to be able to come before your presence. I commit our study into your hands. You are the word. The Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. As we uh, deliberate on your word, my prayer is that your grace will abound over us. In Jesus' name, help me, O oh God, to deliver your word without fear or favor. Great, grant me the anointing to teach your people with all sincerity. In Jesus' name, and let everybody say amen. God, Rachel, bless you. Before that, I want to just spend a minute or two to pray with everybody. Everybody who is listening to me right now, I want to spend a minute to pray for you right now. If you are sick of every part of your body, I believe in divine healing. I believe in the power of God to heal us from our sicknesses. And I'm a, a student of the healing of God. I've received healing. I've prayed for people to be healed. So I believe that God's healing power is still available. Just lay your hands on yourself wherever you are sick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for everybody who is not doing well, who is sick of any form of disease. I pray for divine healing right now. Anybody suffering from COVID, the sickness we are all fighting with at this time, I ask for the blood of Jesus to heal them. Lord, just as you have been with us all these months and weeks, I uh, pray that you continue to be with us. Receive your healing right now in the name of Jesus. There'll be somebody who will be watching me at this time. You are in bed. You can't even uh, get up. I pray for the power of God to be over you. And I ask you to rise up to your healing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Let the power of the healing power of the healing Jesus be with you wherever you find yourself in. Whatever time you're listening to this broadcast, I pray that the power of God will be so strong with you. We want to thank God for your healing in Jesus' name. And let everybody say amen. God, richly bless you. I want you to text somebody, tell them Bishop is on the teachings we're going to receive this Sunday morning. It's a very great teaching. We are still in the book of us, studying from the book of us. And I believe that this is one of the greatest books that you can ever uh, lay your hands on. So just test somebody, tell them Bishop is on and let's all go into the Bible together. Today I'll be preaching, I'll be moving to us chapter four. But before I go to us chapter four, I want to just go back a little bit in Acts chapter 3, which um, last week when I was speaking about 
um, as chapter two, I was ending as chapter two. I spoke a little bit about that, um, but I felt I want to go and do a little summary of as chapter three, um, what I preach on in as chapter two, and then move on. Now, in as chapter three, the main um, story in as chapter three was the first recorded um, narrated miracle in us or among the apostles, the first recorded. And if you read from us chapter 3, verse 1 to um, 10, let me read it. Um, now, Peter and John went up together in the temple in the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask of arms of them that entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asked for arms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of the Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Verse 7. And when he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And when he leaping up, stood up and walked and entered into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it is he which sat for arms at the temple beautiful gate. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at which had happened unto him. Hallelujah. This is um, the healing of the lame at the temple, beautiful gate. What a wonderful narration. One of the things that I like about the Bible is that it's very specific. It talks about the place. The temple, it talks about the gate, the beautiful gate. The temple had so many different gates, Jerusalem gate, um, whatever gate, this gate, the temple, beautiful gate is specified. It talks about the hour. It talks about the beggar. It talks about how he's brought there, his parents carry him there every day to beg for arms. It talks about the disciples that were in question, Peter and John. It talks about the time the ninth hour so these are detailed healing not like somebody got healed here that talks about the miraculous nature of the bible and our assignment and and that is what last week i spoke about um some of the signs of a growing church or a good church is that many signs and wonders were brought among the believers but when you come to Acts chapter 3, so last week I spent time to talk about miracles. This is a miracle. Somebody who was laid there from his infancy, says from his mother's womb, lame from his mother's womb. This is not somebody who is just limping, lame from his mother's womb. And the Bible said prayer was made and all of a sudden he jumped on his feet. Hallelujah. Miracles, and I used last week um, to speak about the importance of miracles. I, I spent a little bit of time on it, so I wouldn't want to go through all of it. But the points I gave was number one: miracles are part of the faith. We believe in it, we pray for it, and it happened. I explain how um, we've we've seen miracles in in our lives, in my life, in the church. Uh, I explained that. Number two, miracles are God's giving. We don't command them. God gives the miracle. It's not in us. It is God that gives it to us. Uh, number three, miracles must be expected. We must expect a miracle. If you don't expect a miracle, you will not get it. So we pray and expect a miracle. And number four, uh, we must give glory to God in miracles. We must glory 
not in the miracles, but we must glory um, in God. God is the giver of miracles. It's not every pastor. It's not any pastor. It's not our strength. So we should be able to understand that. Then I spoke about three forms of miracles. I say we have God's own intervention. We have permissive miracle where God permits the miracle. We have demanding miracle where we demand the miracle. We have regular miracles whereby um, it happens every day. Your life, even as you're watching me, to me, is a miracle. And as such, I don't want you to think you need um, some spectacular miracles for you to believe that your God is a God of miracle. Drinking water uh, is even a miracle. People drink it and it chokes them and they die. You've been drinking morning, afternoon, evening, and you are not dead. And it's a miracle. Going, You're going out and you're coming in. It's a miracle. You don't know the things that the enemy has planned about your life that God has saved you from. So our lives are also lives of miracle. Even though they might not be spectacular, but they are lives of miracle. Right. Now, I move straight to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, there are three things that I want to say, um, preach about in the book of Acts, chapter 4. The whole of chapter 4, um, as I told you, we are students of the Bible. We are not here to just tell you what you want to hear or tell you something that it's, it's nice to your ears. We want to go through the scriptures and look at what the scriptures say. That is why Jesus commanded us to teach people to observe. And that is what we are doing. We want you to be a student of the Bible so that when we finish, we just finish the book of Philippians. And every one of you, when you go back, you'll be able to appreciate the depth in that book. Now we are in the book of us. If you follow it, when I finish preaching through it and you pick it up, You'll be able to explain most of the things that we have in there. Now, in Acts chapter 4, it's broken into three parts. A um, couple of them have already been dealt with, so I will not deal with all of it. But what I'll say is that uh, just as um, um, I spent about four weeks in Acts chapter 2, because there were a lot in there, a lot of individual points in there. But in Acts chapter 4, I can finish it within uh, one sermon because a couple of the things that we see in Acts chapter 4 is already um, covered in Acts chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Now in Acts chapter 4, if you pick Acts chapter 4, it's divided into three and I want um, you to note it. I might ask you, um, sometimes the, the CPC or the youth, I ask them to give me the outline of the book and if I'm going to ask you, these are the things that I'm looking for. So you've got to be listening to be able to give me the exact outline that I have preached. In Acts chapter 4, is divided into three. The first part is what I call defending the gospel. Defending the gospel. And that is Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to Twenty-two, Acts chapter one, verse one to twenty-two, it talks about defending the gospel. That is where um, Peter and John were brought before the council, and they spoke about def um, what has happened. So the first part of Acts chapter four, I, I say defending um, the gospel. Then you move from chapter twenty-three to thirty-one. Believers' prayer for boldness, praying for boldness, praying for boldness. That is where the believers specifically pray for one thing, which I'll come to that. And the ending part of Acts chapter 4 is from verse 32 to 37, where he talks about having everything in common or sharing in common, which if you follow my teaching we have already dealt with it in Acts chapter 2, where they had everything in common. And I gave some points on uh, how we can have things in common. So that is Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is divided into three. Number one, in defense of the gospel. Number two, specific prayer for boldness. And number three, 
in defense of the gospel. And all of them I've given you the, the, the numbers. The first one is from verse 1 to 22. The second one is from verse 23 to 31. And the last one is from verse 32 to 37. So have it down. If you are asked in a quiz or anything, uh, you'll be able to give it. So I want to go to the first part, spend most of my time in the first part of Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, let me read the first part. It's a long reading, but because we want to stand and, and, and talk about it, permit me to read the whole uh, 22 verses in Acts chapter 4. And, and it's a very interesting reading. You will love it, even though I'm not a very good reader, um, but to be on the screen so you can follow that and not follow my voice. Acts chapter 4. And the heaven is Peter and John before the council. Verse 1. And as they spoke unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they made, they, they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they lay hands on them and put them in hold for the next day, for it was now even time. How big many of them which had the word believe, and the number of them was 5,000 men. And it came to pass in the next day that the rulers, the elders, and the scribes, and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. That's what we call the Jerusalem Council. If you hear the Jerusalem Council, that is it. And there they had set them in the midst and asked them, by what power and by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he has been made whole, in other words, how he has been made whole, be it made known unto you and all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This is very interesting because over here, those who say that Jesus was not raised from the dead, over here, you see the disciples who have witnessed the resurrection of Jesus speaking to these high priests that the Jesus you crucified, whom he raised from the dead. So if Jesus was not crucified and was not raised from the dead, these guys could not be standing in front of these high priests and telling them that whom God raised from the dead. Hallelujah. So if you are looking for um, a, a reason or a fact to back out that Jesus was raised from the dead, you see one here. They've prayed for somebody to be healed in the name of Jesus. Then these chief priests who crucified Jesus have gathered them. And their Jerusalem council, there's another Jerusalem council, which was the believers one, but they, they have put them together and they are asking them whose authority. And they said, the Jesus that you crucify, whom God raised from the dead, is his power that has raised this man up. Whom you crucify, whom God raised him from the dead. Even by him does this man stand before you. This is the stone which was set not by the builders, but has become the cornerstone. This is where we, we call the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Hallelujah. And, and let me elaborate on it. Anytime I go to Israel now, anytime I, 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 I land there, most of the people who come to Israel are Christians. In fact, their tourism is the highest one, one of the highest um, income that they have. 
and the people who come there are Christians. The Jesus they crucified, the stone the builders rejected has become their cornerstone. It was true at that time and it's even more true now. Hallelujah. The whole world hates Israel. It's Christians that stand for Israel. The Jesus they rejected is the same person protecting them. Hallelujah. Um, neither is there salvation in any other name. For there is no any other name under heaven given among men where men will be saved. Hallelujah. So over here he's telling the Jewish leaders, look, you've got all these things going around, all this sacrificial system. There's no salvation in any of them. Hmm. Do you think they'll be happy? They will not be happy. So they continue. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that these were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Hallelujah. When they saw them, these are unlearned fishermen, carpenters. But look at the knowledge by which they are dividing the scriptures and they perceive that they have been with Jesus. They have been with the master teacher. So no wonder. That is why sometimes when people who have not even been to school, when they become pastors, all of a sudden the good ones, even though they have not been to school, they become the ones who will be guiding, who will be praying for um, precedence and whatever. Jesus, when you come to him, he makes you a new kind of person. And I pray that every believer listening to me and watching me, by your knowledge and your association with Jesus, it has to make you better. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. They recognize that they have been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing by them, they could not say anything against it. When a miracle happened, you can't say anything. You can't argue. The man is standing there. For example, if I say that, yes, Calvary, God gave us a miracle, you can't argue. The person who was at the hospital and, and was declared dead and we prayed and the person got back to life, the person is still alive. You can't argue against it. Um, just to log in, I normally talk about somebody that we prayed for in maybe hospital with Pastor Kinsley. And, and the person got well. He had a mental problem and they did everything. That person couldn't be healed. When we said, can you give this person to us to go and pray for her for just some few minutes? We took, they gave the person to us. We took the person to the church. We prayed within one hour. We returned the person saying, the doctors asked what happened? A doctor in charge arranged that we come the next day to meet the people. And when we went, he has somewhere about 20 medical staff, doctors, psychiatric expert for us to tell them. And in fact, we said the same thing. The same way they presented it here is the same way. Because I'm the talkative, Pastor Kinsley allowed me to talk. And I spoke. And I spoke. And I spoke. And I said that. When you see people with mental sickness, probably it's not all of them that are probably normal mental. Some are demonic sickness. And the one we dealt with was a demon. That is why your medicine could not help the person, but prayer was able to release the person. When I finished, the head um, doctor of the psychiatric department asked all the doctors and the nurses, any question, nobody could ask a question. It was similar to this. Because the girl was sitting there. The miracle has been done. She's been set free. <laughs> they, couldn't, they, they couldn't ask any questions. You couldn't challenge it. The person was there. And anytime I read this, it's similar to, the, uh, to this one. They couldn't deny it. So saying, what shall we do to these men? Oh, no, let me go back to um, verse 14. And behold, the man which has been healed was standing with them and they could not say anything. Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? What do we do to them? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them and is manifest to us and all those who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. 
They couldn't deny the lady who was sitting in front of them that has been healed of this mental disease. But that is spread no further among these people. Let us strictly threaten them that they may speak hands for no more on this name. It's like these guys, look, this Jesus, we, we, don't, we killed him. He's resurrected. They're doing miracles in his name. We did everything to banish his name. We don't want to hear any more of healing of this Jesus. So let's give them strict warning. Now, what I always say is that when somebody doesn't like you, he doesn't like you. No matter what you do, if even you cut your head for them, they wouldn't like. These guys don't like Jesus, period. So anything that, whether miracle, whether he will say, look, let's threaten these guys so that they don't speak about this. They should shut up about it. And um, But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you or unto God, judge it, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. For when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of these people. For all men glorify God for what he has done. For the man was about 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was shown. Hallelujah. I love this. And, and I think and by elaborating on it, you yourself, you, you can follow and, and, and feel what has happened. And, 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 and you see the power of God in operation. I, I put this in three. Number one, the power of God in operation. Number two, the questioning of the power. And number three, the response. The response is what uh, I'll be talking about. There's no doubt about the power of God in operation. If you look at your life, there's no doubt about the power of God in your life. Um, some of us, some of you, if it had not been for God on your side, you would not be alive by now. Uh, you would have been dead and buried and gone from the time you gave your life to Jesus. Jesus has been good to you. People they didn't give you any chance. People wrote you off. People didn't think you amount to anything. But thank God that you are still alive and kicking. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the past 20 years, you were not like this. The past 15 years, you were not like this. The past five years, you were not like this. Even some of us, the whole of last year, it was a struggling time, but we are still alive. The power of God in oppression in our life, they are without question. Hallelujah. God has done so many things. God has done an amazing miracle in your life for you to still be alive. That is what happened to this one. The power of God was seen manifested. Then it came to people questioning it. And sometimes if you are not careful, even though God is doing things in your life, you might think it's your own. And sometimes if you are not careful, despite the miracles daily, the miracles Hourly, the miracles, weekly, the miracles, monthly, the miracles, yearly, you might rest in your own power and might think that, well, uh, uh, I don't even want to talk about God again. I know people, I know believers that they were praying to God. God blessed them. God lifted them from where they were. They were praying. Some were praying for husbands. God gave them a husband. Some were praying for children. They had it children some were praying for a job they had a job and now they are millionaires and they don't want to give glory to god again they don't want to testify to god again it's like now they are above god and that is a similar situation with the western world that we live in here look this world if you read the history of this world um one of my books about the supremacy of jesus the whole world the whole world probably uh, with the exception of one or two of the uh, Asian continents, the whole world rested on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. 
Great Britain rested on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Germany rested on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And I proved that even the greatest party in Germany is called Christian Democratic Party. America, in God we trust. Their constitution based on Jesus Christ. Great Britain, the Queen is the head of the Church of England. Church was everything. Parliament, as we see, was a preaching pulpit. Those who live in Great Britain, there are churches everywhere. This nation was built on Jesus. But they've come to a point whereby they want to set Jesus aside. They want to shut Jesus up. They want to make Jesus quiet. Don't talk about him. Don't mention him. And that is what the Jewish people were saying. Don't talk about Jesus. Christ. Even though standing in front of them is a miracle. Standing in front of them is somebody that God has healed. The power of God has been in manifestation. The glory of God has been in manifestation. They have seen somebody who was born lame from his mother's womb and now alive and kicking glory to God. But they wanted to deny. If I see people today in Great Britain who don't want to believe in God, it doesn't amaze me. They did the same thing here. But you, are you also doing the same thing? Sometimes our attitude is the same. Some of us don't even want to come to church anymore because of the pandemic. You don't know that there are a lot of people who have not been to church. They are in their rooms, but they are dead now. Some of you don't even want to contribute to church anymore because it's the pandemic. I'm not going to church. So, but you're going to church. Is it to serve God or you want God to serve you? Some of you don't even want to give glory to God anymore uh, because you are in the comfort of your room. You've got your job. You've got your children. You've got your wife. You've got your husband. You've got your fiancé or whatever. And, and you become competent. Is that how you want to live your life? Understand that if we gain the whole world and we lose our soul, the Bible says there's nothing that we can gain out of it. The same way the people of um, Israel, the Jewish leaders behave, make sure you don't behave the same way. In ending with this, I want to talk about the response. The response is in defense of the gospel. Now, Peter and John stood up and they defended the gospel. They really defended the gospel. And I call it defending the gospel. Every believer, wherever you are, you should be able to defend the gospel to the best of your ability. Every Christian, anytime, anywhere that I go, that somebody bring a, a, a topic about God and avail myself to talk about. I will not keep quiet unless somebody run down. I won't be fighting the person, but I will say what I know. If it's a civil debate, I will be part of it. But most of the time, Christians are found quiet. We don't talk about our God. When somebody is talking rubbish about our God and even one answers, we keep quiet. But one of the things I've seen about the other faith, especially, uh, I'm close with a lot of Muslims. No Muslim boy or girl will allow you to run down their religion in their presence. They won't kill you. In, in some other places, they'll kill you. But where they will not kill you, they will try to educate you. They will try to tell you what is the truth. They will try to tell you what they believe. They will try to tell you the right thing. They are always, what I see about the Muslims, they are always ready to defend their faith. But we, the Christians, we are not. We don't defend our faith. Uh, we keep quiet and it makes people look like uh, we don't have anything to say. I'll urge you, be ready to defend your faith. And there are three things that I've written down if you are going to defend your faith um, that you need to. Number one, I call it know your belief. Most of the time, we are not able to defend our faith because we don't even know what we believe. It will be amazing. You put 10 Christians there and they have all been Christian over two, three, four, five years. And if you ask them to give you five verses, they don't know. 
give you 10 verses. They don't know. We don't study the Bible. But the Bible commands us to study, to show ourselves a proof, a worker needed not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of God. But we find ourselves wanting, if we are to give verses, uh, we can't even say 10 verses. If you ask us what is righteousness, we don't even know what righteousness is. If you ask us what is the end time teaching, we don't even know what the end time teaching is. When this pandemic came, um, people are everywhere pushing us. This is the Antichrist. This is this. And we don't even know the answer. First, you have to know your belief. You need to know your basic belief that we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in his power. We believe in his birth. We believe in his, um, first we believe in his conception um, by the Virgin Mary. We believe in his birth. We believe in his life. We believe in his death. We believe in his resurrection. And we believe in his ascension. We should be able to believe in all of this. We should be able to believe in John 1.1. 1, 1, that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. If you met somebody when Christians say Jesus is God. Um, which is a belief that other faiths don't believe that. Uh, Jesus can be God. God is one. If somebody asks you, how can Jesus be God and be this? You can refer him to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Finish. That is our, our Christian theology. Jesus is God. He's not only Jesus. He's God. We need to know our basic doctrine. We need to know of our basic belief. In fact, for from next year or, or from the middle of this year, I'm going to command all of us to learn the apostolic creed. In fact, it talks about the basics of, of, of the Christian doctrine, which you've got to know. You've got to know the basis of the Christian doctrine. So in order for us to defend the faith, we've got to be able to come to the point whereby we know the scriptures. We know about Jesus. We know about salvation. There were some nine concepts that I think um, when I was growing up, we went through number one, how to be born again. Number two, how to born, how to um, grow in, in Christ. Number three, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number four, how to deal with sin. Number five, how to share your faith and, and all of that. And we learned that and it gives us the basis for us to defend our faith. So, if you are going to be a good Christian, you should be abreast with the teachings of Scripture. You should be abreast with the teachings that are done. That is why we are going through um, this. And, and sometimes we, the pastors who are teaching you, are at fault. If you watch our TV stations of all the preachings, few of them are based on Scripture like I'm teaching you. We don't, but... If you go to any Islamic school, they are teaching them the Quran. If you go to any Jehovah Witness, where they are teaching them the scriptures, we are the only ones who are more interested in other things with the exception of, of, of the gospel. Yes, it's good. We talk about motivation, but we don't leave. Motivation can be taught by any university. Motivation can be taught by any business executive, but they can teach this one. So as a pastor, I don't have to leave the scriptures and become a life coach. Where well, thank God for those who are life coaches or motivation speaker. Thank God for those who are motivation speaker. But I have to be, I, I'd rather have the title as a Bible preacher or scriptures, uh, scriptural preachers than motivational speaker or life coach. I don't need those life coaches. I don't need to be a motivation. The Bible is enough motivation. I have met the, one of the greatest motivation speakers called Les Brown. I've met him in Hollywood in one Baptist conference. And he told me, he told me that, look, most of my things that uh, I, I, I talk about, they are all in the Bible. I met him where it was a church conference. So to me, the motivation that we need is more in the scriptures than anywhere. So I don't have to turn myself into a motivation I rather Les Brown and those people. That is their profession. But if a pastor want to preach what Les Brown is preaching, then I have missed the way. There are a lot. That is why our people don't know the scriptures because we are teaching them things that are not in the Bible. We are teaching them um, um, 
I don't want to go into it for anybody to think that I'm attacking, but please, I will encourage you, if you are going to go to church, and if you want to remain a good Christian, underline, a good Christian, you should go to a church whereby they preach the scriptures. Thank you so much, Bishop. That was a powerful word. God bless you so much for always taking your time to break down the word of God so that here at CPC we can understand it. God bless you for your ministry and I pray that he will continue to bless and uplift you in your lives. Thank you so much. Anyway, guys, right now we're going to go into our tithe and offering. So here at CPC, like I said, we believe in 100% tithe and offering. You're not obliged to, but you're just encouraged to give your tithe as we believe in tithe and offering. So wherever you are, the tithe and offering um, information is going to be put on your screen. So please feel encouraged to give. It doesn't matter how much you're giving. It's, as long as you're giving something towards God, it's very, very important. Thank you, guys. <music> Thank you so much for giving guys god bless every single person that gave and those that couldn't give god bless you too because there'll be a way that one day you'll be able to give unto god amen so now we're going to go into our announcements normally this is where lisa comes in and do her thing but i'm gonna try you know i'm gonna try so now every week we say this on tuesday at 7 p.m we have bible studies with our bishop della please why does he always have to send the link before you join? Make sure you're there. Yes, you that are looking at me. Make sure you're there. Show your face. We need to see your beautiful faces. As our bishop says, show your face. If it was Clubhouse, you'd be loud. So show your face on Zoom. Make sure you're there on Tuesday at 7 p.m. on the dot. And join us as we go into the word. This is where we dissect the word even more and find out more treasures inside it. Do you know what I mean? So make sure you guys are there on Tuesdays for our Bible studies. Okay, so next week, Sunday, we have a very, very special service, which is our Mother's Day service. So please, guys, be encouraged, invite more people to join as we're going to have a fantastic time. And I trust the media team, they're probably putting in some mad work, you know. So guys, come and join us. It's going to be amazing. So please invite a friend next week. Make sure you come with someone as well. We're going to have a fantastic time as we celebrate our mothers. So right, guys, come to the sad part. Where I have to go, I know. You're gonna miss my face, I know. Tell the media team to put me on more, like, do you know what I mean? Dark skinned girls need to be out here more. Anyway, that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> so, right, guys. <laughs> um, okay, guys, we've come to the end of the service. I know, I know, I know. It's so sad, but. I've had a fantastic time with you guys. I can't wait to see every single person in person. But anyway, don't worry. This is one more service closer to when we see each other again. So just keep tight, stay safe, wear your face mask, and just keep prayed up. Basically, guys, this is the end of the service. Thank you for having me as your leader on duty this week. And I hope you guys have a fantastic week ahead of you. I pray for greater things. I pray for amazing things. And I just can't wait to hear the testimonies from everyone in a few years' time, or even months' time. Thank you guys so much. And see you all next week, same time at 1.30.